Hey folks, this is Adam Gusso. Uh, you know me mostly as a harmonica instructor and player. I'm coming to you today with uh, something a little bit different. As you may know, and I think I say this every now and then, I'm an associate professor of English and Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. So I'm a, a scholar and classroom teacher as well as blues harmonica player. In fact, I talk about the blues a lot at Ole Miss. Uh, and as a scholar, every once in a while I manage to finish a book. And so that's what I'm coming to you today to tell you about. Um, from the back porch in, uh, here in Oxford, Mississippi. It's my new book. It's called Beyond the Crossroads, The Devil and the Blues Tradition. Um, and it is, well, I'm going to ask you, if you're interested in the subject, to go and am edit to Amazon and take, check it out, see what people have to say about it. Um, it's the first full-length study of the devil figure in the blues. And why is it called Beyond the Crossroads? Well, I'll, I don't have to hold up the book uh, again. It's called Beyond the Crossroads because it, when you tell somebody that you're doing a book on the devil and the blues tradition, there's two things that everybody knows or thinks they know. Number one is they've heard that phrase, the devil's music. And so they say, you must be writing about that. And the answer is, yes, I do. That's chapter one, Southern religion and the devil's music. But they also say, well, you must be writing about, you know what I'm going to say, right? Robert Johnson and how he sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads. The answer is, I do, in chapter 5 and a little bit at the end of chapter 1, write about Robert Johnson. And, and I do write about the crossroads location in Clarksdale, Mississippi. But in both cases, I don't tell you what you want to know. I, I, I tell you that Robert Johnson um, actually told a couple of people that he sold his soul to the devil, but that he was joking, didn't mean it. Um, and there were other people he didn't tell and, and would never have told that to. Um, and, of course, the crossroads in Clarksdale, despite what they say, is not the place where Robert Johnson sold his soul because Robert Johnson didn't sell his soul to the devil. You kind of knew that, right? Um, but, but that's chapter 5, and you have to get to chapter 5. What I do is I give you, in the, in the broadest and most detailed possible way, based on an archive of songs that I collected, the first sort of pretty comprehensive, there's a two or three I left out, but really comprehensive kind of discography of devil blues. Blues that mention, that have the devil in the title, or that mention the devil, or that mention hell, or mention the devil in hell, or have hell ain't, like hell ain't but a mile and a quarter by Big Bill Brunzi. Um, and I talk about a many different aspects of the devil blues tradition. So I talk about the devil's music in chapter one. In chapter two, I talk about a song by Clara Smith, actually authored by Porter Granger and covered four times in 1937, but in 1924, the, the inaugural devil blues recording called Dunn Sold My Soul to the Devil. Um, and by a woman, not by Johnson, recorded in New York City, um, and I sort of talk about that whole thing. I, there's a chapter in which I talk about the devil figure in a selected subset of devil blues songs as a kind of screen figure for the southern white man. Um, for a way of kind of talking about Jim Crow and hell as a, a metaphor for the Jim Crow South or a Jim Crow small town in the song Hell Ain't But a Mile and a Quarter. So that's an element of the devil blues tradition that's not very well known. But how about this? If the devil is, if the white man is the devil, then what does Petey Wheatstraw mean by calling himself the devil's son-in-law? He's saying, I married the white man's daughter. And when you see him like that, then you realize that he's playing a very dangerous game indeed. But he was. And Honey Boy Edwards talks about the figure that he cut with his white woman and his little white dog on a chain promenading down Main Street in East St. Louis. Um, so that's, that's an element of the tradition that works its way in. I talk about the devil, of course, as a figure in love relationships. That's by far the most common form that the devil shows up is, you know, must have been the devil that took my, my woman from me. So there's a whole tradition of that and I look closely at these songs. I try to understand the world view of the people who were making and singing these songs. What it meant to be free suddenly. Um, what it meant to be in a post-slavery generation, two or th uh, two, maybe two generations removed from slavery. What it meant to be experiencing your freedom and what role the devil played for southern black folk trying to experience their freedom. Um, and then of course I get to that fifth chapter and it's more as much about white folks as black folks because it's about the movie Crossroads. Um, and I talk about actually my take on the movie Crossroads 
is that it's, and I interviewed the, uh, the, uh, the author, John Fusco, and um, uh, Arlen Roth, um, and Crossroads was being created during the period of time when, for the first time, you had Stevie Ray Vaughan in 1983 win a Blues Music Award. Actually, it was the W.C. Handy Award. It was the first white author to do that, first white musician to do that. And so I sort of talk about it in that context. What does it mean that in Crossroads you have two white boys, both of whom are guitarists, neither of whom can sing the blues, but the future of the blues is at stake. You have older men. You have Scratch here, and you have um, Willie Brown here, and each of them has a white boy. And we're going to say, which white boy deserves to play the blues? Well, if you do that, then you just don't pay attention to the fact that there are no young black men around to play the blues. So I think Crossroads is doing some very interesting work, as we say in the Academy. Anyway, this is Dr. Gusso telling you what I'd like you to do. If you're interested, I would appreciate the following. Go to Amazon, because that's the big sales point for this sort of thing. Check out the book. See what people have said about it. I don't think it's been reviewed yet. Maybe, it, maybe you'll review it if you like it. And think about buying a copy. Don't even think about the hardcover. It's $90. University of North Carolina Press. Yikes. Um, I think libraries have to pay that price. But the soft cover, this one here, is $29.95. And do me a favor. If you're going to buy it, if you decide to buy it, um, buy it new, buy a new paperback from Amazon, don't do what I sometimes do with books I want, which is, uh, you know, going and getting the, the used one. This book is just about to come out as I upload this. Um, I could really use your support. I'm like the politician. I could use your support. Seven years in the making. Um, it's got a great discography of all the Devil Blues, and it's got a photo of Vic Barberi, the little-known maestro of the Crossroads Clarksdale sculpture. It was him who did it. I interviewed him. Anyway, this is Adam Gusso saying thanks so much. Uh, think about it, and um, I look forward to be back with you soon. Bye-bye. Yes, I forgot one thing. While you're at it, make sure you go to Spotify uh, and, and find the playlist called Beyond the Crossroads, or go to YouTube. I've got a playlist called Beyond the Crossroads, and each of them has 95% of the, well, 90 to 95% of the recordings in my appendix, so it, it has like 130 recordings in each case of Devil Blue songs. So that'll, if you buy the book, you definitely want that as your soundtrack so you can kind of see what I have to say about things, including Robert Johnson, who I've not talked about, but I have a lot to say about. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.